Good afternoon. Welcome. Hi, I'm Lowell Peterson, the Executive Director of the Writers Guild of America East. Welcome to our, our humble home. Uh, we are very pleased to be working with Hollywood Health and Society in presenting the Double X Files, Health and Justice for Women in Film and TV. The panel today is going to be addressing issues that our members grapple with all the time, both in their lives as well as in their work. Uh, as a matter of a point of personal privilege. When I, when I first got involved in politics uh, many years ago, one of my central areas of focus was uh, the issue of uh, violence against women, particularly sexual violence. And as a young guy, I was really eager to write legislation and policy. And the women who worked with me on this uh, were careful to let me know that addressing consciousness was at least as important as addressing policy. And so I'm doubly pleased that the Writers Guild can work with Hollywood Health and Society to raise some consciousness, uh, both concrete information and addressing some of the perceptions and misperceptions in this area. And I'd like to uh, introduce from Hollywood Health and Society, Marty Kaplan, and welcome Marty to the Guild for another great event. So, uh, Double X, double welcome. <laughs> and you look terrific. This is really a great crowd, and uh, I thank you for coming. And you are what makes this event important. The panel, yes, but you, well, and many on the panel, but you who tell America's and the world's stories have a power, and we are thrilled to be a resource for you as you wield that power responsibly. I'm Marty Kaplan. I am the director of the Norman Lear Center at uh, USC's Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism. That's a lot of uh, brand hierarchy going on in there. And Hollywood Health and Society is a program of the Lear Center. It's named for Norman Lear because of his generosity and also what he stands for, the, the bringing of a social consciousness to uh, entertainment. We are honored to be able to honor him uh, by carrying uh, the work that he did and does forward. So Hollywood Health and Society, a great program which has been part of the Lear Center since its inception. We began in the year 2000 and if you've ever run anything, you know that it is a dream to have people who do things who are unbelievably competent and reliable and charismatic and cheerful and also like to raise money. And you put all those things together and it's my great privilege to introduce to you our uh, ringleader who will in turn pass the ringleader baton, uh, the director of Hollywood Health and Society, Kate Fold. We promise we're going to get to the panel soon. There's just a couple more of us up here. Thank you, Marty, and welcome, everybody. Um, it is a great group looking from up here. I just wanted to thank also uh, staff member Armine Kuroyan, who is over in their corner. Wave, Armine, because she's going to be important to you um, throughout the day. And also Dana Weissman from the Writers Guild East over here. Thank you both for all your hard work in putting this event together. Um, yeah, a little round of applause. And also to Diana Gonzalez, who's consultant to Hollywood Health and Society um, in Miami and works with Spanish television. Um, we're grateful for you to be here and also for your support with the event. So thank you very much. In your packets or in your stack of papers, you have an evaluation form which we would love for you to fill out at the end of the event to let us know what you thought of the event, how we could uh, better our presentations, or if you just thought we were absolutely terrific, please tell us that as well. And Armine and Diana will collect them from you at the end of the event. So please remember to fill those out. It really helps us to know um, how best to uh, provide these kinds of events and services to you. Okay, so quick commercial. 
Hollywood Health and Society, we're a free resource to the entertainment industry providing up-to-date information and access to experts to support accurate storylines on health and climate change. So if you're working on a storyline that has to do with anything, anything to do with health in the broadest sense of the term, uh, you can reach out to us. I always say we have operators standing by to take your calls or answer your emails. Um, if you have a quick question that you need language for, for a script you're working on, we can do that. We can also bring an expert to you, to your writer's rooms or through a conference call so that you can really go through the issue in more depth for your uh, storyline. And the best part about what we do is it's all free. So there's no charge and we don't take a credit. We're here to support you and to support the great stories that you all tell. So um, please email us, call us, Keep us in mind whenever you're working on a story. And just in terms of climate change, I always like to say um, it's probably the biggest health issue we're all facing, right? So it fits under our umbrella very nicely, or not so. In addition to the consultations that we do, we do panel events like today, we do screenings, we even take writers on field trips to immerse them into the subject matter um, to help you get a better experience and understanding. Um, and again, this is all to support your work. When it comes to medical health, climate science, uh, anything to do with health at all, we've got your back. Please, um, please reach out to us. And if you're tweeting today, um, we're using the hashtag women's health. So please tweet about what a great discussion we're going to be having and all our fabulous panelists. Um, and we'll be sure to share them as well. Before I leave, I just want to introduce our next speaker, who is Valerie Borden. She's the principal advisor in the Division of Strategic Communications at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services Office of Women's Health. Oh my goodness. <laughs> and I would like to say also that the Office of Women's Health and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention are two of our primary funders for the work that we do to enable us to then provide these services to you uh, free of charge and for no for no uh, credit. So Valerie, please join us. Thank you, Kate. It's a real pleasure to be here. and I'm so glad to see such a great turnout. So today I'd like to take um, a look back at how far we've come in the last 30 years and where we might want to go in the future. And I'll just briefly touch on the three topics that the panelists are going to address today as well. This year marks the 30th anniversary of a landmark report that helped to propel women's health to the forefront of biomedical research, medical practice, and community health. So this really did propel women's health um, into a new realm where we could practice something beyond what I like to call bikini medicine. So basically, a woman's health involves more than just a reproductive function and more than what um, is covered by her bikini. Specific health functions, conditions, they just, they work differently in women and, than in men, and that's really just due to the basic nature of, um, of cells that make up a woman. So for example, a heart attack in a woman looks very different, or couldn't look very different than it does in a man. She might have shortness of breath or an upset stomach. Not, those are atypical symptoms. So while it will be impossible for me in five minutes to list all the advances of women's health in the last 30 years, I'd like to call your attention to just a few notable ones. So one is the increase in a woman's lifespan. And this has been driven in large part by fewer deaths from cancer and heart disease. More women are getting screened for, for cancer and fewer women are smoking. In 1987, 27% of women 50 and older got a mammogram, or reported getting a mammogram in the past two years. Today, 72% are getting uh, mammograms or reported in the last two years. That's a significant increase. And breast cancer deaths have dropped by about 10% as a result of uh, mammography screening. And under the Affordable Care Act, most insurance companies must now cover breast cancer screening for women 40 and older at no cost to women. And you'll hear more about breast cancer from um, Tamika Fairley on the panel. We've made tremendous strides in caring for women with HIV and AIDS. So not only are women living longer with HIV and AIDS, but due to new treatments, we've lowered the risk of a mother passing HIV to her baby to less than 1%. So that's basically ensuring the health of a future generation. And women today have an array of safe and effective forms of birth control, including emergency contraception. There's been an increase in the use of the um, highly effective long-acting reversible contraceptives, such as IUDs and implants. But while the overall health of, the Ameri of American women have Im has improved since the release of the 1985 report, not all women have benefited from these advances. Serious health disparities still persist, 
especially among groups such as the disabled, immigrants, poor, uninsured, women of color, and those living in rural America. And so while we know, as I said, that women's health is more than just her reproductive health, her health before, during, and after pregnancy is vital. Expecting mothers today tend to be older or heavier or have a chronic condition such as diabetes or high blood pressure. And since 1987, the rate of pregnancy-related deaths has more than doubled. Yeah, it's actually more than doubled. You would have thought it would be the opposite. So much still needs to be done to improve the health of moms and their babies. In the United States, about 50% of pregnancies are unplanned, despite the multiple types of contraception that are now available and even covered under the Affordable Care Act. There's really been little improvement in this statistic over the years. One in four American women experience intimate partner violence in her lifetime, and many of these experience significant health outcomes throughout her life as a result. So one way to help address this social ill, the White House um, Task Force to Protect Students from Sexual Assault released a report with recommendations and best practices for schools. And one of them is preventing sexual assault as well as engaging men. Since then, my office has partnered with the White House and Generation Progress in launching It's On Us. It's a campaign aimed at fundamentally shifting the way we think about sexual assault. So I encourage you all to go look at itsonus.org if you, if you haven't already. It's, a it's On Us is a declaration that sexual assault is an issue in which we all have a role to play. We are reframing, basically reframing sexual assault in a way that inspires everyone to see it as their responsibility to do something big or small to prevent it. And I'm really hopeful that with your help, we can create an environment where sexual assault is unacceptable. And again, you'll hear more about that from one of our panelists. That's it. Thank you. I also want to thank Lowell and Michael Winship, who couldn't be here today, and the Writers Guild East for partnering with us in, in this event. I wanted uh, the special privilege of being able to introduce our moderator today. I lobbied for it, and I got it, and I'm thrilled that I did. Uh, you, you have her bio. I won't go through it all. Uh, just a, a, a few things. In 1996, she was co-creator of The Daily Show and ushered in an era that we now kind of take for granted. But the idea of uh, sat satire on uh, American television did have a birthday. And uh, you lit some of those candles. So thank you for that. <laughs> she is from Minnesota, which I take special pleasure in noting because she manages to incorporate both the niceness that comes with that, and also that kind of purple rain edginess that, <laughs> that, I, yes, yes, that, that, I, that I love. I was uh, in the time. <laughs> I, I was very fortunate uh, to be a colleague of Liz's when Air America Radio began. Liz was a co-founder and host of one of the key shows in the lineup. Uh, it was called Unfiltered, and her co-hosts were Chuck D. and someone that only people in North Holyoke, Massachusetts knew about named Rachel Maddow. And so uh, it was a great pleasure for me to uh, walk around and, and see Liz and, and get to admire and appreciate her work. And uh, her show lasted longer than mine. So, <laughs> um, Lady Parts Justice is her passion right now. If you, if you uh, uh, read, uh, follow Liz on uh, Twitter, you will see the most amazing retweeted hate mail that, that she gets, <laughs> usually preceded by the phrase, he seems nice. <laughs> which is, is, I think, has become a national uh, catchphrase. <laughs> and I love her dearly. No one could be a better Sherpa for us today as we go through this. Please welcome Liz Winstead. Hi, that was, I appreciate that. That was way too long, though. Um, so it's funny, when he said she's from Minnesota, I thought he was going to say, and she has part of that passive aggressive nature that we all know about. <laughs> People from the Midwest. Um, so I'm so happy to be on this panel with so many smart people, so many people who actually care about incorporating um, the conversation around women's health. I'm somebody who 
I was always trying to figure out, I, my origins are a stand-up comic and then I became a writer and a, and a producer and, and now I kind of combine all those things with this um, nonprofit that I'm doing and it's, it's really interesting to try to find ways to drop these really intricate conversations into spaces of entertainment because women aren't a monolith Culturally, we're not a monolith, you know? A white middle-class woman like myself comes from a very different women's health background than a woman of color. Um, you talk now about trans kids who are coming up. You know, we have all of this stuff to talk about, and some of the battles that I found working just in corporate media were not only some of these topics are tricky, but that it was actually said out loud and is still actually said out loud that these are things that only women care about. And you know, the last time I checked, women occupy half the planet, and uh, women get pregnant from the other sex, or sperm from another, you know, the sperm comes from someplace, and we don't, we don't get pregnant from vibrators, is what I'm trying to say. So there's two people involved, so those issues are important. You know, uh, everyone has a mother, a sister, uh, a daughter who could get breast cancer, and we all discover our sexual selves in a way and oftentimes in a way where we don't have all the information we need and we go to college and we're drinking and things happen. So why these things aren't like, oh, we need more storylines about this has kind of always been um, surprising to me. So I started this nonprofit basically to, it's sort of like Funny or Die meets information about all of the uh, reproductive assets that's eroding coming from state levels. And so you go to the website, you click on your state, and then you go, oh my god, I live there. Um, <laughs> and then hopefully you take action when we give you some plans. But to know that this is expanding from dropping it in pop culture spaces to dropping it in pop culture spaces in a way that makes sense is really cool. So I will talk, um, and I'll just say one more thing. And I'm, I'm, I'm really happy that the work is happening. And some of you have done a really great job. And I love that. And I think when I will feel incredibly excited that we're on a path is when I see a, a, a young woman who is a really likable character who had to have an abortion so because she just wasn't ready. And she didn't have a cold heart. She didn't have a stigma about her. And when I see a woman with a really complicated life be able to get some justice in sexual assault, then I will be really excited. And those are the storylines that I really hope we can push for and have because those are two things that are happening all the time. And judgment is placed on both in a way that I think you guys are going to be really awesome at um, making happen. So before, um, before we introduce the panel, uh, we're going to roll a little bit of a video of a montage of how people have talked about these issues throughout um, their, their particular um, avenues. So have a look-see over here at the video. Are you willing to discuss the circumstances? I became pregnant as a result of a sexual assault. Are you saying that you, you were raped? You've never spoken publicly about this before. No one ever asked. Can you tell us what happened? Uh, it was college. A classmate we were dating, and it happened on a, we had a fight and he forced himself on me. Did you tell anybody about it? I mean, did he, was he charged? No, because at the time I felt that I was somehow at fault. I knew I wasn't, but I just didn't want to be stared at. I didn't want to be known as the girl who got raped. And when I became pregnant, I wasn't going to drop out of school. I wasn't going to let this man ruin my life. So I made a choice. I ended it. But if you never told anybody about it, the assailant could still be out there. Can you tell us anything about him? I saw him uh, for the first time in almost 30 years, just a few months ago. Where? At a commissioning ceremony that Francis and I attended. Did you speak to him? Briefly. Francis pinned stars on him. He was being commissioned? <sighs> General Dalton McGinnis. I don't remember what happened between us. I don't remember 
You know. <sighs> Damn. I mean, we were both pretty drunk. I know I was not loving life this morning myself. And if I don't remember, how do I know that I wanted it to happen? Hey, if you had said no at any point, I would have stopped. Did I say yes? What? That's ridiculous. What was I supposed to do? Stop at every single point and ask, do you want this? Do you want that? No, no one does that. One thing leads to another. You're being crazy. Do not call me crazy. The problem of sexual assault on campuses is enormous. I think it's fair to say that they cover these crimes up. There's a lot of victim blaming. He lectured us about how we shouldn't go out in short skirts. They told me, despite the fact that I had a written admission of guilt, that what I presented to them could only prove that he loved me. They discourage them from going to the police. If it goes to the police, then it's more likely to end up as a public record. What do you have there? These are some photos I've taken of Mom before and now. How nice. I got a camera for my birthday. Timmy's very talented. All of our children are talented. Yes, Beth's talented, too. Oh, how nice. Uh, <laughs> maybe this isn't the best time. This was before. So I could remember them always. OK, that's that's uh, enough now. I, I think so. Well, there's one more I want to show you. Where's that one? Ah, this is my favorite. Look at the light and how the arm is. If you hadn't been breastfeeding, you never would have thought that lump was a clogged milk duct, you would have gone to the doctor as soon as you felt it. Cancer wouldn't have gotten this far, and you wouldn't be here making this decision. Am I close? <laughs> what kind of mother blames her own baby for her cancer? A mother who's human, a mother who's overwhelmed. Good to see you, girl. Hey, you too. Here's your emergency contraception pill. You should take it as soon as possible. Yeah, I know, Juana. How much do I owe you? There's no charge for the yellow. You qualify for free birth control here. And if you apply for the Affordable Health Care Act, it can all be free, even at the pharmacy. No shit. No shit. Now, remember, your new birth control pills won't take effect for four weeks. So use condoms. I will. Are you sure you want to do this? Yeah, I can't be pregnant anymore. I can't. <laughs> okay. Well, um, how, how are we going to pay for it? Craig gave me money when I went last time, so I still have it. Okay. Do you want to call him? No, Parker. Just you and me, okay? Okay. So there's a bus that leaves for Chicago in, like, half an hour, so if we hurry... We... No, no, no. You know what? Actually, I have my mom's car keys, and I got us some stuff to eat so that we don't have to spend that much money. Thank you so much. Aside from codifying the somewhat odd notion that <laughs> corporations can have deeply felt religious beliefs, one thing struck me about the decision. Hobby Lobby didn't want its employees' insurance to cover certain contraceptive methods, such as Plan B, because they said that method caused abortions. The only problem uh, with that is, 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 is not, uh, um, that's what I'm looking for. True. Um, <laughs> at least according to the Food and Drug Administration and the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, although, what do they know about vaginas? I don't think. <laughs> Not as much as the owners of a store that sells foam cones and glitter. So this is how it's gonna work. I'm gonna introduce the panel and, and just give you a little bit of a, a, a quick one of what they do. You have all of their bios in your um, packet. Um, and save your applause to the end. Just, I feel all of a sudden like I'm Gwen Ifill moderating a panel, it's pretty sad. Um, so I'll just go down and then we will start conversation with question and then follow up with each of the people and then we'll open it up for you guys to ask questions. Sound cool? Okay, great. Um, to my left here, first up, is Dr. Deborah Howry, the director of National, the, the National Center for Injury Prevention and Control at the CDC. Next to Deborah, we have Bo Williman, playwright, screenwriter, and Academy Award nominee for The Odds of March. And he's the creator and showrunner, Emmy Golden Globe winning House of Cards. 
Next to Bo, we have Tamika Farrelly, Senior Health Scientist with the CDC's Division of Cancer Prevention and Control. Next to Tamika is Peter Hedges, novelist, writer, and director of three films, including Pieces of April, a film that features a mother battling breast cancer. We have Dr. Reagan McDonald Mosley, the medical director at Planned Parenthood of Maryland. And Jean, is it Passan? Passanante. Seasoned soap opera writer, currently on The Young and the Restless. And we have some storytellers in the front row. Raise your hands so people can see where you guys are. Mary Beth Seitz Brown, organizer with Columbia Alumni Al Allied Against Sexual Assault. And Desiree Walker, breast cancer survivor, patient advocate, diagnosed at age 38 and again at age 47. How about applause for all of our people? Oh my God. So much to talk about. Um, we're going to start with sexual assault, and I'm going to go first to you, Dr. Howry. Um, it's, it's in the news, and what I find incredibly troubling when we talk about sexual assault is how much hate is thrust at people who are trying to raise attention to the subject. You bring up sexual assault and you hear, not all men are rapists. It's like, wow, I didn't, maybe you are one because you just attacked me for just talking about it. Um, but also, where are we at in the conversation? Kind of set the stage for where it's all at. So, and that's why I'm excited to be here today because I, I wear several different hats. And prior to coming to the CDC, I was an ER doctor and the Title IX Deputy Coordinator at a University. So all this is near and dear to my heart. And um, when you look at some of the numbers from sexual violence, they are astonishing. And not astonishing in a good way, as I always tell my daughter. Um, more than 300,000 women were raped in a single year on college campuses. And that number, when you look at other issues that happen, I mean, we're just not talking about And that's it. just reported. The that's just reported. reported. And, and I think it's one of those things to where the more we talk about it, um, like in House of Cards, to have these conversations, it's really helpful. So I talk about it all the time to everyone. <laughs> um, and, and along with that, when you just look at a study that was done recently, 19% of undergraduate women have experienced attempted or completed sexual assault. 19% of college women. So, 19, <laughs> but still, 19. And when you're looking at the ages of those who have ever been raped in their lifetime, 80% of women who've been raped and 71% of men, it has occurred before the age of 25. So if we're gonna talk about preventing violence, we need to really focus on our youth to prevent it before it occurs. This is happening, most of these actually happen around age 18 or earlier, but 25 or earlier is when 80% of all first rapes have occurred by. And we have a lot of misperceptions about it. It's not that stranger on the street. It's not that dark corner. It's the person you know. Only 13% of rapes are committed by a stranger. Most victims of sexual assault do not report victimization. And I can tell you that because I've treated them in the emergency department. And most don't come see me. Those that I saw, I would always thank them for coming in because that's a huge step. And I would know that coming into the ER in itself was traumatic because the exams are not comfortable. You're in a cold room, you're already scared, and we're re-traumatizing. So I always thank women for coming in, telling me they did the right thing because we know if we can support women, that's the best chance we have on getting women to report sexual violence. I've completed over a hundred rape exams easily in my life, and I've stopped counting. But I still remember many of them. And there was one woman a few years ago who had come in kind of sheepishly with a friend and just said she wanted the morning after pill. And I said, you know, how, how can I help you? And said, I, I may have been raped. I said, well, this kind of changes our conversation. Um, and I brought her into a private room and said, how, how can I help you? And she said, I don't want to talk about anything. I just want some antibiotics in the morning after pill. And I said, I hear you. This is kind of what I've been doing research on for over a decade. Um, I'd like to revisit this conversation. 
what happened. I wasn't really willing to talk about it at the time. I said, here are your options. We can do nothing. I can just write a prescription for a morning after pill. I can do a general medical exam and make sure that there's nothing that I need to treat you for. We can do a forensic exam. We can call campus. We can call the police. She agreed to a general medical exam. And on exam, her genitalia were extremely swollen and bruised. And most of the rape cases I treat don't have injuries. And that's another important fact to realize. Most women don't have significant injuries on a rape exam. Does not mean they were not raped. This woman had a significant amount of bruising because she was unconscious when she was raped. And so there wasn't that lubrication. She was just traumatized repeatedly and repeatedly. So I told her my concerns. We talked about it. She still didn't want to come forward to the police, but she did agree to report it to the campus police. And we found out that this had happened repeatedly by the same person. So by coming forward and reporting it, we're at least able to bring attention to this one individual. And what I would say, too, is in my Title IX hat, I wouldn't do it if I didn't believe people couldn't change. And I think we need to change social norms from saying don't be a victim to don't rape. And so I would go around to many different groups and talk about, I would never start off with rape, because as you were saying, the second you talk about rape or sexual violence, people shut down and don't want to hear it. So I would talk about respect, professionalism, safe relationships, being a good person. And then I would add in sexual misconduct and rape. And after one session I did, I had a dean crying. I think it had really hit home, and I was brought in to do this lecture because there were concerns on campus that this was happening. Afterwards, two women came forward and disclosed rape. And what was even, um, I think, really surprising to me was a male came to see me in my office. And he said, I think I raped someone. And he said, I never thought it was rape. I didn't get that what I did was wrong. And I said, that's a first step. I wouldn't do this if I didn't think we couldn't bring awareness to the situation and change it. He actually entered counseling. And I said to him, again, people can change. And it's important that you realize what you did was wrong. These were medical students. These were medical students. And I kept saying to everybody, if you're going to be a doctor and you can't realize what rape is when you're doing it to somebody or that it happened to you, how can you take care of others? How can you be their, patient, you know, their advocate? How can you help them with reporting? And so that was a big eye opener for me. There is a lot that we can do on campuses. We can change the culture by making sure it's both student driven and top down. If administrators are giving lip service but aren't actually showing by example and supporting policies, there's not going to be change. Similarly, we have to look at do survivors have a safe environment. One of the women that came forward to me in Title IX, her grades were failing. She didn't want to attend class with a person that was, she was accusing of rape, and she was worried about school. Fortunately, the school really worked with her, um, and she was having one of the counseling, too, which occurred during a mandatory class. They worked with her to address all that. But if that system's not in place, it's going to fail. <coughs> The other two things I'd bring up are alcohol policies and just really looking at alcohol. Alcohol does not cause rape. Let me say that again. Alcohol does not cause rape. <laughs> but it can increase the risk of perpetration or victimization. So looking at restriction of alcohol on campus or at local facilities is really important. And the second thing is bystander interventions. At CDC, we've funded two um, promising ones so far, green dots and bringing in the bystander. Because not all bystander interventions are equal. But these two are showing a lot of promise. And what it does is changes the conversation around social norms, gets people to be witnesses to inappropriate behaviors, and to actually step in so that things like what just happened last week at a Florida spring break don't happen. People realize what's happening, step in, intervene. And what I like about bystander interventions, it impacts other types of violence. Not just sexual violence, but bullying, dating violence, the whole spectrum. So if you remember nothing else I've said just now, please remember violence is Inevit is not inevitable, it's preventable. And by starting early and focusing on perpetration and changing the conversation around social norms, we can have a huge impact. Thank you. I just want to go, I just want to go back to one, one little follow-up there. 
and, and that that is don't rape. <laughs> and I say that because um, there's been so much language around the conversation to have with young men about rape, and the, the, what you hear from people who are just sort of exploring it for the first time is, how can you have sex? It just sounds like you negotiate every time. It's like, that just sounds awful. And I'm like, if you think negotiating during sex is awful, you haven't had good sex. <laughs> because having sex with someone is always a negotiation, right? It, if it's get off my hair or if it's more of that, <laughs> less of that, it's all, but I mean, you know what I right. mean? So like the way you have to introduce things also in, there's the very practical way and then there's the, let's sit down and talk about fucking. Because every step of the way, it can be awesome. But the first step is, if the person is incapable of saying yes or no, that's a no. And then every step of the way, find out what someone likes. And if they, want, and if they say no right then, just stop and take a break and talk about it. You know, it's like she likes you enough to have started something with you. If she wants to take a break, be cool. It's good. But I think talking to our boys in a way that, because when people are young and inexperienced sexually, I think you don't understand you'll have sex again sometimes. It's like, I'm having sex with this person. Am I ever going to have it again? I don't want it to stop. You know, just all the things that go around it that you want to dismiss, but that are very real for some people who are sexually naive. So I think exploring all those things are really important. 100%. I okay. mean, I think it's about having, I mean, the, con like having, have, have, <laughs> having the conversation. You know, yeah. ha and again, it's not just about the actual act of rape itself. It's right. about, you know, violence, misconduct, the whole spectrum about always, you know, having consent and um, I think just valuing people. Right. Respect. Right. Well, let's move on to you, Bo. Um, you guys talked about it and it was super powerful and it was great. And when you're thinking about a storyline like that, how do you think, is it, we need to talk about this because it's part of the world that we're, we're creating. Um, did you feel a sense of responsibility or did you feel like this is just part of this world? Like how did you, how did you approach the subject? Uh, well, I, I, I was privileged enough to see a documentary called Invisible War by the uh, same filmmakers who made The Hunting Ground. Mm -hmm. um, quite early on, there was a very small screening in LA that I went to, that a friend brought me to, and uh, I, I really didn't know what to expect. You know, I, I just kind of went as my friend's, um, you know, date to the documentary. and. Uh, I, I was completely shocked. Uh, I grew up on naval bases. My dad was in the Navy for 30 years. Um, and for those of you who haven't seen the documentary, it, it, uh, it takes an unblinking look at sexual assault in the military. Uh, estimated 30,000 sexual assaults in the military, uh, of which only 10% are reported, of which only about 10% of those, 10 of those actually get to any sort of hearing, and only a handful are actually prosecuted in some way. And to think that, you know, it, it inevitably, uh, uh, because I was on large naval bases for the first 10 years of my life, surrounded by thousands of servicemen and women, uh, it, it was it, just the numbers dictate that this was happening close to my house. This was happening on naval vessels that were, you know, at port just down the street. Um, that's the Navy calling. Um, <laughs> They're coming in. Okay. No, and you know, I had such, uh, I have such great respect for the military, uh, for my father's service, um, for uh, you know what was a pretty incredible childhood for me, and to think that this, this was, uh, this, these places were a nightmare for some people, uh, both men and women. In, in the military, it's actually 50-50, but that's only because men uh, comprise so much more of, of, of the service population. It's disproportionate in terms of, of the female population. But um, so, you know, I, it, it stuck with me. And, it, and we don't approach the show, uh, you know, we have non-ideological protagonists. I mean, they, they are out there power for power's sake. So it's not like they're glomming onto an issue and saying, this is what I care about, I want to change the world. Uh, that said, they're not complete sociopaths, and there are things that do matter to them. Uh, and, uh, you know, when I brought it up with the writer's room, I said, this documentary stuck with me. Um, you know, I, I, something about this and Claire feels right to me, let's discuss it. I want to, you know, if we are going to explore it, explore it responsibly. Um, and, uh, and we began having that discussion. Um, it was important to, you know, the more we talked about it, our goal, I think, as storytellers is to, you know, hold a mirror. 
Uh, and the more I learned about it, the mirror said this was an endemic problem. Uh, it's, it's if you want to portray the, the, the country, this is a part of it. And, and in portraying gender at all, I mean, a lot of people ask me about strong female characters or how do you write your women? And I say, I have an issue with the term strong female character because why, why aren't you asking about strong male characters? Yeah. There are strong women, there are strong men, there are weak men, there are weak women. Usually we're a mixture of those things. Uh, depending upon given circumstances. And the important thing is uh, everyone's needs are gender blind. I mean, the need for love, for respect, for power, ambition, trust, betrayal, these are all gender blind things. That said, characters, by virtue of being men or women or trans, uh, they, they have particular experiences that are specific to their gender, which you shouldn't ignore. Um, and it would be, so, the key for me is not to reduce a character to their gender. Claire experiences hot flashes. She's going through perimenopause. Uh, that's part of her life, but it's not her story. Right. You know, it's just what, we're not going to ignore that. And it would be, you know, it would be weird for Frank to have hot flashes. Um, so <laughs> that's not going to be part of his story. So anyway, um, you know, we 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 explored it, and we actually found, uh, you know, that there were a lot of different views on that. Um, you know, in our scenes, we want everyone to be right in a way from their own worldview, and there was a lot of conflicting uh, narratives, uh, you know, in our show in terms of how to approach that uh, topic. And the main thing was to to sort of just say it's here, there, it's complicated. Um, it's something that means something to Claire, and uh, let's do our best to dramatize the complexity of it. Um, since then, it's it's uh, you know as a result of that partly, uh, I ended up seeing a play uh, which some of you may have, have seen a, a performance or two of called Slut the Play, mm -hmm. uh, which was developed by uh, Katie Capiello and Meg McInerney. In that play, uh, they they've they've. Uh, had a, a school for young women, an actors program, uh, starting with these girls when they were eight or nine years old. And the stories they develop are, are based on their own experiences. Uh, and this play has an unflinching look at uh, sexual assault and slut shaming among 13, 14, 15 year old girls performed by these young women. Uh, extraordinary play in terms of its terrible beauty. Uh, its rawness and its honesty, um, and, uh, and the fact that it's being performed by these women uh, makes it that much more powerful. Uh, so, you know, we're uh, helping them organize next month uh, in D.C. Senator Gillibrand is co-hosting this event. We're going to do it for 2,000 students and lawmakers in D.C. Uh, performance of this play. Um, get the senator and some of her colleagues up on the stage to talk about this stuff. Uh, and that play, you know, approaches the topic in the same way we attempted to, which is all the complexities of it. Um, and, and I think, you know, uh, just the fact that these stories are out there, um, that they're not easy to resolve, that, that there are a lot of points of views, uh, but, but just sort of saying we can't ignore it, that, that if you are going to hold the mirror up, this is what the reflection is, um, is an important thing. And, you know, I, I also, you know, you're far more um, an, of an expert on this stuff than I am, but I, uh, you know, yes, prevention is a big deal and a big part of it. But you know, after seeing the Hunting Ground and especially Invisible War, um, you know, I, I'm ashamed that the university I went to, Columbia University, has such an abhorrent uh, uh, track record yeah. of disciplining. Uh, this sort of abuse. I mean, you know, you have Ivy League institutions where hundreds of sexual assaults are reported each year, and you can count on one hand, um, or on in some of them, no hands, the number of those that lead to disciplinary, disciplinary action. You want to prevent as much as you can, but there are predators out there. We know that this is a thing where it's repeat offenses. Mm -hmm. uh, you have unsafe campuses and high schools and middle schools. Remove the predators. If they I believe that every university, when you apply and when you are accepted, every student should have to sign a waiver saying that if you were disciplined for uh, uh, sexual assault, that you cannot sue the university. Because the reason the universities aren't actually disciplining these people comes to, they'll all agree sexual assault's wrong, but it costs them money. 
cost them money to get sued. And I think that if you're a university that you went to, if you give a dollar, you give a million dollars each year, you have to call up, uh, you have to call up the people that you're donating to and say, I will not donate another dime until you have a more progressive stance on how you discipline sexual assault. Because unfortunately, like politics, it's always, it always comes down to the money. And I think we have to um, be honest about that. Uh, we want to change the culture, but you have to force the culture to change. Yeah. And there's a price tag to that. I also think, I also, that is just great. By the way, Valerie, I hope you come next month. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, yeah, I have to go okay. I, I also, and I also <laughs> think too, I think it's really important to support and protect and have the back of creators that really want to take these strides on. You know, making sure that you are paying attention as creators, as viewers, as advocates to say, good on you. Because people get blowback and you get stuff. And so it's really great to always know that if you're going to take on controversial topics that you know are for the greater good. Because sometimes you do feel like you're just out in the world. You're like, oh my god, I just put this out there. Holy shit. Um, I'm just being attacked from all sides. And so to be able to be a really good partner in that, I think is, is really important. And I want to come, when we go around and come to questions, I, I want to ask something specific to you about how you actually approach. I wanna, and I don't want to ask it now, but I want to remind myself and remind all of you. When you sit down and have a brainstorming meeting and you really talk about these topics, how you make sure everyone's included and everyone's heard, because I think as creators, and we, if we want to explore this stuff, it's really nice to get some advice on how to do that. Um, Mary Beth? So much power in simply telling your story. And so much inspiration when we want to take somebody's story. So um, we would love it if you would share your story. Great. Um, yeah, thank you so much for um, having me and uh, for all of you being here and being willing to learn and hear these stories and internalize them and use them in your work. Um, in a lot of ways, you are actually consent educators um, and you are health educators. Um, because if you think about the number of years that you're that I've watched television and just internalized messages about what sex looks like, what rape looks like, um, it's probably now 15, 20 years that I've had those messages, and I've had probably two hours of consent education in my entire life. Um, so, 18 years versus two hours, um, it's the messages that I've gotten from television and from uh, movies and from the other media that I consume um, really did affect me when I was assaulted. And I was assaulted twice, um, once when I was a first year and once when I was a second year. Um, and both had very different dynamics. Um, once I was sober and it was by my boyfriend and uh, happened in my own bed. And I didn't really have the language to put to that for about a year after when I sat in on that consent education, that second hour that I had. And I heard people defining what consent was and defining what rape was. And I was sitting there thinking, huh, that happened to me a year ago. Um, and I was really grateful to have that opportunity and hear uh, experiences that other people shared and realize that I could claim that word rape because it was so loaded. Um, and because of the image that I'd seen on you know, crime shows or just heard from people talking about rape, that experience that I had where I was just in my own bedroom with someone that I loved and trusted and had, had consensual sex with before didn't really match up. Um, so the work that you're doing and the work that you're writing really is informing whether or not people feel empowered to come forward when or if this happens to them. Um, and it's not just me. I think often a lot of people that are portrayed in the media look like me. Um, they are white women that are about my age. They're probably not fat or trans or low income or immigrants. Um, and those people are all disproportionately affected. So I hope that you're showcasing some of their stories as well. Um, but I think when we talk about campus sexual assault specifically, uh, something that I've learned from just all of my friends, and there are a really heartbreakingly huge number of people that I know who have also been assaulted, um, and it's, you know, when they were drunk, when they were sober, when, by someone that they knew, by someone they didn't really know, by their best friend, um, you know, they're just an infinite combination of factors that can go into these experiences, and there really isn't just one story to tell. 
Um, but when we talk about campus sexual assault, we also have the added institutional and community betrayal that comes out. Um, and this happens everywhere. You know, if you think about um, sexual abuse within churches, within the military, within schools, you know, public schools and um, pre-K and there are just so many other institutions out there that are invested in protecting their own image, that are invested in protecting, um, you know, and not being sued, as Bo just talked about. Um, and so what that often means is that if someone, you know, manages to push past the notions that they have about rape that they've internalized, um, manages to push past their own self-blame, their own depression and PTSD and anxiety that they are most likely experiencing after being assaulted, and then report, they're then betrayed and often re-traumatized by those systems. They're discouraged from reporting, they're told, you know, what happened to you doesn't count because you're transgender, so it's not possible for you to be raped, as one of my good friends from college um, experienced. Um, and there are just so many factors within that institution that are fighting against them and um, preventing them from seeking healing and justice. And so I have an ask of all of you, um, two asks actually, and the first is to portray more examples of affirmative consent. So consent where it is actually a conversation where people realize you know, it's not the negotiation, it's not the contract, it's actually very normal and healthy and better sex to have this kind of conversation. And make sure that everyone that's participating is enthusiastic and fully on board with what's happening. Um, so that people don't have to go the 18 years to get their first hour of consent education in an orientation workshop that they're probably skipping or not actually paying attention to. And instead they get those messages in little bits and pieces throughout their lives and they realize this isn't actually that hard to figure out and my life will be better if I understand what affirmative consent is. And then the second ask that I have for you is that if you do choose to write about campus sexual assault or sexual violence in general, talk about more stories and provide nuance and realize that you know, very rarely, there is no such thing as a perfect victim, um, as my friend Will Gotway Wanjuki mm. created a hashtag to um, address when we heard um, some interesting articles that were defending perpetrators in the past couple of months. Um, and she really came up with that hashtag to show that there are so many different ways to respond to sexual violence, just as there are so many different ways to experience it. Um, it happens to men, it happens to trans folks, it happens to women, it happens to women of color, it happens to people who are queer. Um, and to erase all of those complexities and provide just one narrative is actually going to have an effect on people and whether they feel like what happened to them was their fault um, and giving them the chance to put some language to it so that they can seek the resources that they need. Um, so that's what I ask of you and I hope um, that you also seek out, there are so many other survivors out there that are talking publicly and great activist groups um, that are doing really amazing work uh, to you know, bring more attention to this issue and actually push for the accountability that we need and the prevention services that we need. So don't just listen to me, find them too. So yeah, thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, I also think it's important to show uh, women initiating sex in a healthy way. You know, really having women be the person who seeks out somebody and does that and showing that that is a positive thing because so often women, part of the not reporting sexual assault comes from you wanting to just have equal footing in the sexual realm. And when you do that, you all of a sudden are someone who is not to be believed, someone who is not to be trusted. I hear time and time again from women, uh, one of the reasons that they uh, believe that they won't be believed if they report sexual assault is because once you've had cons consensual sex as a woman, you are branded as somebody who is not to be believed. And reshaping that narrative so that none of that has anything to do with when you're sexually assaulted, I think is really important. Another thing that I think is really an unbelievable thing that I discovered in doing my reproductive justice work is that in 30 states, uh, it is legal for a rapist, if, if a woman gets pregnant, pregnant from a rape, he can legally sue for custody of the child. 30 states. 30 states. Yeah, that is not even a joke. Vermont just repealed it um, last year. A t high school girl found that law on the books in Burlington, Vermont, and brought it to the attention of the state ledge. And they were like, oh, I guess we should take that off the books. But 30 states. So when you think about things like that, um, and you think about these men's rights organizations who are really out there and really ugly and really perpetrators of a lot of things, um, 
you know, it's it's important to know we live in a in a culture that just doesn't doesn't want to hear it. And so, for us to be creative in our ways to do that, I think it's really important. So, um, thank you all for doing that. Thank you for your story. Um, we're going to move on from uh, sexual violence to breast cancer, and it's the most common cancer among American women in general. African American women under the age of 35 have breast cancer rates that are two times higher than Caucasian women the same age. Young African American women are also three times as likely to die from breast cancer as Caucasian women are of the same age. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable, Tamika. Um, it's unbelievable. What are, or I guess, if you could just kind of give us an overview of why it is that that is the case, in that that women of color have these startling statistics more so than than white women. Way to start off with a tough question. I know. I'm here. You know me. <laughs> Thanks. I'm Charlie Rose over here. <laughs> That, that, that's a, a difficult question, but I think it's one that um, across research and science and advocacy that folks would love to have the answer to and are actually looking for. Um, and a lot of it has to do with a variety of factors. It could be things like differences in actual breast cancers. They're not all the same. Um, it could be differences in when a young woman actually goes in for a diagnosis and is treat and treatment. So diagnosis is a totally separate thing, how long she may wait before she actually goes in um, or if she actually knows the signs and symptoms to even be looking for. Um, and, and those kinds of things really affect the timing of diagnosis. So a young woman who has possibly been having symptoms for months in a fast-growing breast cancer, right, could be diagnosed as late as stage three um, and possibly later. And that does occur, and it probably occurs a bit more often than we'd like to, like to see, and certainly a bit more often in African-American women. Um, there are factors around, you know, the, the resources, you know, and, and whether or not someone has the resources to go out and even get that kind of care. Um, we have screening programs, national screening programs that are available right now because there are guidelines that recommend mammography for women who are 50 years of age and older. Now that's the CBC um, mem mammogra National Breast and Cervical Cancer Early Detection Program. Um, and, and so that's in place. And so for women who are 50 and older, and in some cases women who are 40 and older, we've been being taught that over time. At a certain age, you should get your mammogram. You should start to do certain types of things towards screening for breast cancer. But for younger women, that's not the case at all. Um, and that's not something that is, um, that's necessarily promoted because we don't necessarily have the scientific evidence that says if we do mem mammography or certain screenings for these younger women in a mass level, the way that we've been doing for women 50 and older, that it's going to reduce their mortality. So there are all of these complex pieces that are really sitting and packed in on top of each other um, that I think we're trying to, uh, really trying to address. Um, but one of the things that we are really thoughtful about um, is the fact that awareness about the fact that young women can and do get breast cancer is one of the things that we have to really push forward. Um, we started in 2010, we received a congressional mandate um, to really address this, is this issue. Um, and so when you look at the numbers, and I think they're actually here in, those, in some of these stats, you see that 200,000 women are diagnosed each year with breast cancer, and 40,000 women die each year of breast cancer. And, and we think about that, and a lot of times we think, you know, pink and, you know, those kinds of things. But when you stop to actually look at the ages, the majority of those women in that 200,000 category are women who are older than 40 or women who are older than 50. But 11% of those women are women who have been diagnosed under the age of 40, under the age of 45. And, and that's the population that's kind of been untouched for a long time. They're the ones that we haven't been actively going after, um, at least not at, at, at this level. Um, they're the ones who have been experiencing breast cancer, um, who have been suffering the side effects of treatment and care, um, who have been struggling with the process, and, and now we're, we're really trying to engage and start, to start a dialogue about breast cancer in young women. Um, it, it's, it's definitely been challenging for us, you know, as we've been working through it, because it's something that we haven't really done, you know, historically to really work on breast cancer in women of this age. It's difficult. It's how do you, when do you start having this conversation with a young woman about breast cancer, right? What do you say that's not going to cause fear and terror? 
Um, what are the kinds of things that you actually in educate her about? What are the actual messages that you would give a young woman about breast cancer? And, and we've had to really think through those a lot. And we've had partners in the breast cancer community who've been helping us really think through it and talk, talk about that quite a bit. Um, um, in the African American community, there are uh, probably a myriad of factors. There's, there's the diagnosis, there's treatment, and then there's this whole back end of breast cancer that we don't talk about as much. And I want to talk to you a little bit more about that. Um, when I started this work, um, I've been in cancer for a while, but I only started in breast cancer. Uh, in 2010, and so I kind of came on to this project. Did you switch over to breast cancer? I did. From? Um, I was in, I was really in survivorship, so I was more of a generalist really talking about life after diagnosis and treatment. Um, but I switched to breast cancer to do this work because I was very interested in what was happening with young women. But more on a personal level, what was going on with young women, but I moved into this area. And I remember really, you know, trying to learn more about breast cancer in young women, and I found that there are all kinds of discussions and dialogues about it. There are all of these challenges with diagnosis and challenges with treatment and who gets what. And, um, and then I, I started to actually meet real women. Uh, and, and if you work at the federal level or if you work at a state level, if you work in an area where you're kind of removed from real people, and, and Deb has a little bit different of experience, she actually worked in clinical care, but for those of us who have been kind of removed, um, it's very different when you actually start to engage real <laughs> people. It's not, we're not talk, talking populations anymore. I'm not talking about 200,000 women and 40,000 die and 11% do this and 55% do that. It's actually real people. And I remember this instance where I went to uh, a conference and we were doing a few things at the conference. One of these was um, a focus group study because we really wanted to learn more about, you know, young women who are living with breast cancer. And the other was just a session I happened to somehow make my way into, you know, kind of, I don't even know if I got invited or if I just snuck in the room. And I remember sitting in that room and I was listening to young women, um, young African American women talk about their experience with breast cancer. And they talked a bit about, you know, the diagnosis and really the shock of the diagnosis, um, and which I think we would expect. And then they start to talk about things that I had not thought about, things like challenges with fertility after treatment. Right? And it's not that all young women may not face that. It's it, the different discussion was, I didn't know until I was two to three rounds into chemotherapy that I would have problems with fertility. Right? Mm -hmm. I didn't know that there, were, there was support that I could get around behavioral health. I didn't know that these things were available for me. I didn't know that I would have these issues at all. They were completely blind. And so there was a level of trauma that came after the diagnosis, there's the trauma of the diagnosis, the difficulty of that, the, the difficulty of treatment, and then to find out on the back end, there's all of these other pieces of life after cancer. And, and we found that um, even in some of our focus group work, we were trying to kind of get to what's, what's at the heart of this and how would we shape messages and what do we need to say. And one of the single messages that came out um, was you know, young African American women were saying to us that when we look at the resources that are out there from all of the big, you know, entities, whether they're government or what have you, none of them look like us. Right? They don't look like us. And so we don't pay attention to them the same way. They don't look like us. We don't connect to them the same way because they don't look like us. And so that, that's a challenge because even if you're delivering messages and health messages and you're saying all of these great and right things, if the audience doesn't connect with you mm -hmm. because there's nothing in there for them to really connect to, to you have a real problem. And, and that was one of the things that, that really struck with me, st well, stuck with me, um, but also struck me as well. I, and then I remember leaving that room and kind of hearing that and pondering this, and this is all happening in a compressed weekend, so I was like, wow. Um, I remember going out and a young woman came up to me, and it was a young African-American woman, and she was 22 years old and she was very articulate, and she introduced herself to me, and she started to tell me her story. She says, well, I'm 22 years old, and I really want to get involved in your work, and you know, I, I feel like this is really, really important. And 
she was diagnosed at a very late stage. She was already metastatic. You know, she was she was fighting through all of these different pieces. You know, um, and living through the different pieces of being a young breast cancer survivor. And she yeah. even talked about this. She, you know, she she let us me have con candid conversations with her. You know, about it. What because I was new, completely new, so I didn't know. So I was really listening to what she was telling me about her life and her experience and what she knew and what she didn't know. And she reiterated some of those things that I had heard, you know. I didn't know that I would have problems with this or with that or with the other until well into treatment. Um, or I didn't know how to manage, right, some of the things that I was feeling, you know, after treatment or even doing, during treatment. And, and I talked to her a little bit about it and to see like, you know, okay, so what, would, what can we do to help? And she said the same thing. She said, there's, there's no one talking to me, right? There's no one who's speaking directly to me. There's no one who's speaking and sharing the story with me. And that, that touches a lot of different levels, which is why I'm really excited to be here, because you actually speak to the world, right, on this level that I, I can't necessarily reach. You know, even though I work for the government and I get, you know, a certain amount of resources for campaign dollars and things like that, I never would have the reach that you have. But there are young women, young African American women, young women of other, other races and ethnicities who are living with a breast cancer diagnosis. And there are messages that they would do well to hear and would love to hear. But African American, young African American women are saying to us and, and have reiterated it in different ways um, through some of the work that we've been able to do over the past couple of years. It doesn't look like me, you know. Well, and you know, it's, um, I think that is such one of the most gigantic takeaways. Um, this organization that I run, we have 75% of the women comedians and writers are women of color. Yeah. And it's really cool. Mm -hmm. And what I found that is very interesting to that is that's what we heard over and over again. And white women don't, they're, um, they don't notice that it's a bunch of women, like they're excited it's a bunch of women of color, they don't right. make an assumption about it either way. Right. But when women of color don't see themselves, it's glaring and, they, and they're like, this must not be about me because it's never about me because we oftentimes create women of color into the, they just reduce them to this invisible society. So it just can't be, like I just think that is such an incredible takeaway to make sure that people see who they are because the invisibility factor is just huge. You know, another thing I just want to say really quick and then we're going to sure. move on to Peter. It, it happens in so much of women's health in general mm -hmm. where we don't, has anybody ever talked to anybody really about menopause? Like what happens right. to a woman when she goes through menopause? There's nothing yeah. about that. And you look at the commercials and it fucking kills me. <laughs> so there's a commercial for Viagra and some hot British woman's like, I can't wait for my man to come home. This cock doesn't work and I'm just gonna be on this bed. My hair is blowing and it's awesome and I'm great. And like, he's so wonderful, it doesn't matter. And then there's an ad for something that's called, and I can't remember what it's called, but it's some kind of similar cream thing for women for if you have like sexual dysfunction as an older woman and the women look like prison guards <laughs> they are have this dour face and they're like standing there in their chico's outfit and it's like now you can have sex that's tolerable and it's like it's unbelievable and you're just like wow it's like you have these women like oh god if i have to cream and then these you know it's like crazy just I'm sorry, it's just it's like, <laughs> we need to talk to each other about when shit's gonna go down, like right. what it means right. that we're not alone, what it feels like, and if it's young women who, whether it's breast cancer, and then specifically narrowing it down, but we need to talk about it and show it. I mean, cancer brain alone is a thing that if anybody's ever lived with anybody who's been through cancer or been through it, like that is a thing that is real. And somebody feels like they're crazy, nobody really explains to them what that is, and as, a, as an ally and a supporter, you don't know what it is, and you're like, what the fuck happened to you? It's like, uh, chemo, I guess, I don't know. You know, so like to be able to portray those things I think is really important, so blah, 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 enough, Peter. You made a beautiful movie. Tolerable sex, it's just gonna haunt me. I'm sorry, <laughs> but like, when, now you're gonna think of me, so... when you see this commercial, you're gonna think of me when you see those women standing there like, like, it's just, uh, it's just enraging. Wow. I know. Wow, I'm blessed. Um, you took on breast cancer in a really beautiful way. Mm. And 
I always love and admire when men take things on because it's a it's a it's a humanity issue that touched you and that it's not a gender thing and it really felt like this just touched you because it was important and it's happening to human beings mm. and I just love to know what your inspiration was in talking about it sure um, uh, well it all comes down to my mom and uh, who used to say to me all the time Peter you never want to be the smartest person in a room. And I would say to her today, if she were alive, I have succeeded this afternoon <laughs> um, really beautifully. Um, but uh, no, um, you know, I can't. Joseph Brodsky said that uh, nothing has a greater future than money. Well, it seems that uh, nothing has a greater future than cancer some days. I mean, everyone just seems to have cancer. Can cancer's everywhere. Um, my, my mother did not have breast cancer. She had um, cancer pretty much everywhere when they found it. Um, but it, it, I think they determined it started in her colon. But my, my mother-in-law had cancer at that time, breast cancer, when I started to write this. And, and um, uh, so um, when my mom was getting sicker and sicker, uh, I was navigating her health care with my sister. and. She kept saying, what are you making? What are you making? And, and I, I, I said, I, I can't really write anything right now. I, it just doesn't seem important. I just want to find you better doctors. And, and she said, I'm really tired of talking about my doctors. Can, can, we, can you make something? Just make something. And one day I f opened a file on my computer and I found um, notes for a, something I'd made some years earlier about a girl who was trying to cook a turkey for Thanksgiving. The story where that came from had to do with trying to pick up a girl on the subway and having no tools except to say, I'm a playwright, and if you're ever in anything, and she sent me a flyer after, years later, after I was engaged, so I didn't even know my wife at the time, <laughs> saying, I'm in this play, and I had this interesting Thanksgiving, and I couldn't cook a turkey, um, so we had to borrow all these apartments, and I said, that's that's such a great idea because I've been looking for ways to put people together who would not normally be together. I felt like all of my stories were really white and Gilbert Grape, everybody's white and, and you know, I'm from Iowa where everyone was white mm -hmm. and, and, but I couldn't think of a way to get people together and this girl gave me this idea about somebody trying to cook a turkey in a, and, but what I put in my notes was um, the reason why she was cooking the turkey was because she had a, this bad relationship with her mother and her mother had cancer. And I called my mom up and I said, oh my gosh, I found this, these notes. And, and I had actually told my wife the idea when I came up with it. She said, it sounds like a sketch, it sounds like a sketch. And, and so I kind of put it away. And I told my mom this and she said, oh Peter, this sounds like a story you're supposed to write. <laughs> And so, Are you divorced now? No, no. <laughs> I don't know if that's because you're interested or because you're concerned. <laughs> Probably concerned. Let's, let's just leave that. No, let's it's, just leave it's that out good. there. We can it's talk a, later. It's a mystery between us. We can talk later. Okay. Um, but, but what ended up happening was um, I, I tried to speak at her funeral, and um, I had no words, and I just stood there. And um, my mother had an amazing story of a... a woman who uh, got sober when she was 47 and spent her life after that helping all sorts of people, particularly women, get well, saved hundreds and hundreds of lives. And I couldn't honor her at the funeral and um, I was so upset and I just sat there afterwards going, I can't believe I couldn't say anything. I had no words and I just decided I wanted to make something special as a tribute to her, not about her. And so that's what the movie ultimately became, was my attempt to um, articulate uh, my respect for her incredible ferocity and all the ferocity I see with all of my friends, um, my friends who've dealt with AIDS and so many who've had cancer, and so too many uh, that have had breast cancer. Um, so it, if, and the interesting thing was in my very first draft, when I did a reading, I'd made the mother of this almost saintly character. She was just, you know, she had cancer, so I had to make her be the person who you all felt sorry for. And, 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 it, and it, it was really cloying. And, and my mother had real grace and real humor, and I was surprised how much humor there was around the disease, too, and how much could be manifested in its, in its 
in its ugliness and in it, and its beauty, strangely. And a side note, I also read around this time an interview with a woman who, um, I wish I knew her name, but I can't remember names, but she was kind of the Ray Kroc of hospice. She didn't kind of develop the concept, but she made it great, made it important. Mm -hmm. And they asked her when, they asked her how did she want to die? And she said, I want to have cancer. And people were just appalled. And she said, no, no, um, I, I, I would prefer a cancer death because that gives you time to say thank you I'm sorry and goodbye. Um, of course, I don't like the goodbye part. I'd like to thank you, I'm sorry, and hello. I'm sticking around. <laughs> um, and, and I think those stories are important too. But, but that kind of informed what I wanted the movie to be. Um, uh, so anyway, I got lost because I was really about to make a really cool point. Um, but anyway, I, um, so, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm writing this. And, and oh, and we did this reading, and what I realized was that if anybody had permission to be angry, it was the character named Joy, the mother in the film. So when I, when I allowed her to be really mad that she was running out of time, and to really build this separation between her daughter, uh, played by Katie Holmes, she had a daughter who doted on her and a son who had just loved her, and then she has this daughter that the only time in the film the word cancer is ever mentioned, she says, um, you know, I, sh she bit my nipples when I was breastfeeding. No, no wonder there's cancer. She's the cancer. That's what the mother says about her daughter. So they have a lot of ground to cover. So what I was interested in was um, what we do when we're losing people we love mm -hmm. and how, look, we all are, we're all here on limited time anyway, you know. Uh, it's, anything could happen at any moment. But, but could a movie set on a day with people who were far apart, could, could the fact that um, we're all mortal and we're all dying, but, but some more quickly than others and some have a real ticking clock, could that inform a kind of grace? Could grace be found in that? And, and that's all I, I tried to do. I, I, I didn't try to do anything more than that. I, I was fortunate because I, uh, we had no money. We shot the movie in 16 days for $300,000 uh, and, and tried to find a way to deal with um, a lot of the, the physical aspects and the symptoms that uh, would, would be manifested in, in joy. Uh, she smokes uh, medicinal marijuana with her son in the bathroom. At one point, she throws up. We see her in the bathroom twice, and it gets on her wig, and you see her wash the wig, um, and then you see, and then, and then you realize, oh, that has been a wig, um, and then that the only time you really understand what the kind of cancer she's dealing with is in that short scene that we saw, and I was fortunate that there was a, a brave woman in the world who allowed us to use her post-op photograph, and and the movie's about making memories, and and the movie ends with a photograph of the family together. Sorry. Spoiler alert! Uh, but for this this moment this moment of grace. But anyway, um, cancer has taught me so much and um, continues to teach me. Uh, and 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 I, I guess I wanted there to be a story uh, where there was, even if it was just for a moment, that it that it that you know there could be uh, an emotional and personal triumph. And so that's what I tried to do. I think that's great. I also think it's important to show, which so often we all feel, whether you are somebody who has survived cancer or somebody who has um, had, had a loved one, um, being able, you get mad at them. You get mad at yourself. You, you know, people are imperfect people no matter what. And then when they get cancer, sometimes they're still assholes. Right. And now you're dealing with an asshole with cancer. And like all of that stuff is real. But like you have feelings about it and those things come up in your life and it's real. And so I really appreciate st struggling with really difficult relationships in, in these terminal situations that are really hard. So thank you. And in a strange way there is, I, I, I mean, look, we all wish it didn't exist. Let's give that a fact. But there is an opportunity, I mean, you learn this as a storyteller that, that there, certainly if you're directing a film and it's all falling apart at every moment too, that every obstacle that comes your way is an opportunity 
there is an opportunity in it. It may be a hard opportunity, but try to find it and try to, um, you, you know, try to, try to grow from it. And, and um, anyway. Um, Desiree, yeah. we're going to hear from you. Desiree is a survivor, and I love co talking about making a film about to having somebody talk about um, A, how you see uh, survivors portrayed, and, and just your story. Thank you. Well, it's um, a pleasure for me to be here and have this opportunity because I definitely think it's something that we need to focus on a little more deeply. As was stated earlier, I was diagnosed at the age of 38. And I like to say, you know, I fall under the young adult category at that time. And that's something that we need to really realize that when I was diagnosed, no one was really talking about young adult cancers. It really wasn't a focus. And I was an individual who actually believed that based on what I had seen in the media, um, as well as what I had seen in terms of family and friends, that breast cancer only affected the older woman. And so I had never met a young woman that had been diagnosed with breast cancer when I was diagnosed. And so it was a shock to me um, that here I was because that wasn't what happened. In addition to that, I had always heard that, you know, it was something that more Caucasians had. So as an African American, I really didn't think that was an issue for me uh, as well. So for those of us that know about the disease, realize I had a huge learning curve. Um, and so for me, what I realized was I needed to understand more about breast cancer. Um, it was no longer something that was over there. It was real. It was in my back door. And so I said to myself, let me try and educate myself about this disease because I realized that if I didn't know enough about the disease, potentially when I went to have my consultations with my doctor, I wouldn't even know what questions to ask. And we talk about the access. One of the things is at the time, and let me just go back for a moment, how I was actually diagnosed at the age of 38, um, one might have said it was a fluke. The company that I worked for was a premier financial institution that offered free mammographies or on-site mammographies. And so, being that it was available, I said, eh, I'll just go down to the nurse's station and have a mammogram done. And so I did that for three years before I got the phone call. And so, you know, one of the things that I would say, yes, you know, we spoke, to, Tamika mentioned earlier about age 50, and for some, they would be had 40 um, as the age of mammogram. But, you know, if I think about it, if I had not had the opportunity to work for a premier institution that was offering mammograms and took advantage of it, I probably wouldn't be standing here today um, because I would definitely have been diagnosed at a much later stage. Um, in addition to that, I'd also like to state that the experience, the journey of breast cancer, it does matter where you go and have your treatment. And working for that institution, they made sure I was at the best hospital, I had the best doctors, um, and I was taken care of. But that is not something that happens to, I'd say, the average person. For example, you know, if I was working at McDonald's, would I have had that access? Probably not. And so the experience clearly would have been something different. And you know, I am also wanted to just highlight, we talked about um, being out in the media. One of the things that I have found with all of us, we look and have our thoughts and based our opinions on what we see. And oftentimes, if you don't see someone, you say, it has nothing to do with me. Um, but when you can see someone that is experiencing something um, and, and they look like you, then you pay attention. And it's then a whole different experience. And one of the reasons why I've been doing the work that I've been doing since my initial diagnosis was because I realized in the African American community there really wasn't a lot of talk about breast cancer or any cancer because it was always ta taught or spoken about as being taboo and the stigma. 
And so I said that it was important if we were going to try and start to save lives or have a better quality of life for those that have been diagnosed, we need to let them know that it does exist. Um, and so I wanted to be the face of the disease to make it a little bit more real. In addition to that, I've gone and I've participated in a lot of different conferences, et cetera, because, and I've also done a lot of work with researchers because, again, the reason why we don't know a lot about young breast cancer, we don't know a lot about African-American young women, is because we usually do not participate in clinical trials. Researchers do not really deal with us. One, whether they're not seeking us or whether we don't even know that there's an opportunity. And so not having that opportunity, again, we are not really part of the mix. And I felt that it was important to start going out and giving a perspective on some of the things that we face um, as young young women diagnosed with disease, as well as some d issues that are pertinent to the African American community as well. Um, and because if you don't have the language, and many of us don't have the language, because I've been amazed over the years at the women that I have finally met who were African American with a diagnosis, many of them did not have the jargon that was needed when they went to the doctor for the first time. They went through the process very quickly. I fortunately had already had my children. I, weren't, I was not planning on having more children, but no one ever spoke to me about the infertility that would potentially come from the adjuvant therapy. No one really spoke to me about the option of even having eggs frozen if I wanted to potentially have children at a later stage. And so these are the things that, you know, whether or not the doctors are too much in a hurry or don't think that it's necessary to talk to you about it, but I think that it's so important for us to realize that it's real. We need to have transparency. We need to have full disclosure so that we can know what our options are and we can be educated with the decisions that we're made. Because one of the things that I often say is that, you know, in the media, we either see the really sad part of breast cancer or we see the really positive, but we really don't see the in between. And I think that it's so important that if you're going to talk about a disease, you really need to give people an understanding of what that journey really is so that if someone else has to be on it, some of the fear may be there, but a lot of it can be removed because you realize it's not as bad as you potentially perceived based on what you heard about 50 years ago. And so one of the things that I would just like to say, you know, in closing, um, I actually started a support group for women of African American, African, and Caribbean heritage. Because in my outreach, I was often asked the question after I did presentations on breast cancer, well, where do I go to a support group for women that look like me? And so it is so important that when we put things out into the media, we have to make sure, especially if it's worldwide or if it's just for the United States, that it actually reflects the communities that do exist so that people can feel that this is something that is potentially applicable and that they should pay attention um, to that particular uh, experience and journey because you just never know when it may come knocking and you want to be as prepared as possible. Thank you. I think that's a good thing to take note of as creators and writers that not only just to portray the person and the disease itself, but to be able to sort of put doctors on notice and, and, and let people know what they can and should be asking that they didn't know. Like that is such an amazing thing that we can do. You think so much about putting the face there, but being able to watch a show where it's like, oh wait, I, I can ask to, uh, I need to ask about, you know, fertility. I need to ask about what this stuff is. That's a really good point. And thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, Dr. McDonald, Mosley, you work for an institution that I often refer to as a national treasure. Um, I, I spend all of my free time fundraising for Planned Parenthood. Thank you. It's what I do. <laughs> um, because I feel like without having affordable access to all of these things, uh, whether it's breast cancer screening, whether it's abortion care, um, people cannot control their destinies. And it is first stop to making sure that people who 
need affordable health care can have it. So thank you. Um, we all know the assault that Planned Parenthood is constantly under by the myriad of places, including funding, including people. Um, tell me about your perspective. Uh, it's such a disconnect between what Planned Parenthood does and the sort of way that these people are defining what Planned Parenthood does. Thank you for asking that question, and thank you for being such a huge supporter of Planned Parenthood. I so important. love I appreciate it. people <laughs> not having children when they don't want to be preventing a, it. It is my favorite thing It's a novel thing in the world. idea, isn't it? My favorite thing in the world. Uh, but I'm glad you asked that because it connects to a couple of the conversations today. And number one is just sort of this issue of like, well, what do we do? Who do we talk to? Who talks to young women about breast health and sort of what the screening is supposed to be for young women, right? Like we know 40 or 50 years old, depending on which guideline you follow, you're supposed to get your mammogram, but what about before that? And that's what we do. So we are the ones who talk to young women about breast health and breast awareness. We do clinical breast exams, identify masses early and refer people, um, and we give them the right language so we don't scare the crap out of them such that they don't want to get that follow-up test. You know, and say, likely it's, it's probably nothing, but let's be sure, and I'm gonna guide you through this. I'm gonna help you through this and make it comfortable for them. So in the real world, what Planned Parenthood does is we take care of our patients. We take care of men and women. We give them opportunities to learn about their bodies, to make good decisions, to learn about healthy relationships, um, to make positive health choices, and when they have made bad health choices, to help them figure out what to do about that. Um, that's what we're here for. And one of the things that Valerie mentioned I just wanted to briefly talk about is this issue of unintended pregnancy. In the United States, 50% of pregnancies are unintended. And um, that is way more than many, many countries, and it's unacceptable. And there's so much more that we can do about this. Um, in the United States, women who use reversible methods of birth control are mostly using what? We're using pills and we're using condoms. And those methods are great if they're used um, perfectly, but in the real world, they have a really high failure rate. For pills, it's about 9%, and for male condoms, it's like 19%, right? So we have other methods that work. These LARC methods that Valerie mentioned, intrauterine devices, contraceptive implants, the failure rate is less than 1%. Right? Less than 1%. They're awesome. So why aren't more people using them? And the short answer is just because as a society, we create a lot of barriers, both social, economic, financial, and healthcare system barriers. We, doctors, us, the healthcare system, are part of the problem. Um, but there's a lot more research being done on this. Um, for example, the Contraceptive Choice Project that was done in St. Louis. It was an amazing project where a novel idea, women could come and get excellent, patient-centered, evidence-based counseling, and any birth control method of their choice for free. And they found that 75% of the women chose one of these long-term methods, right? And that's compared to the CDC study where it's like 1 to 4%. You know, 75% chose one of these long-term methods. And these women um, were more satisfied with their method. They used it longer than if they chose a different type of method. The study also showed decreased rates on unintended pregnancy and population-wide decreased teen pregnancy. So it was a game changer, right? This is like, for family planning nerds like me, this is everything. Um, so let's take a patient I saw last week, for example, just so that you can see what this looks like in the real world. A 23-year-old woman comes to me. She's a, I live in Baltimore. She's a server at a local restaurant, part-time college student. Um, she's here for birth control. So the old school way would just to say, OK, you want birth control? What birth control method do you want? And most likely, she'd say pills, because that's what she knows about. And we'd give her a prescription for pills or maybe a three-month supply, send her on her way. We did her no favors there, right? I didn't help her. Now we have this evidence-based method, right, where we start not with what birth control method do you want, but what's your reproductive life plan? How many children do you want to have, if you want to have children at all? Novel idea. And if you do, when? And so we start the conversation there. She says, I'm not sure. Maybe I want kids in the future, maybe two or three, but really, I don't know, right? So we start the conversation, and we, and we provide this sort of uh, motivational interviewing techniques. And then I explained to her all of her options, starting with the most effective methods, right, where we used to just say condoms, pills. So we start with the most effective methods and go down from there, talk about the risks, best benefits, side effects of all of them. And then she has some additional questions when, after I talked about the IUDs and the implants. She said, the IUDs, I thought those were like, you know, older ladies who were done with childbearing. I didn't think as a younger woman who've never had, who's never had a child that I'd be eligible for that, because that's what some doctor had told her before. So we dispel these myths, and in fact, um, ACOG, the American Congress of Obstetrics and Gynecology, says that these methods should be first line for every woman, and the uh, American Pediatric Association also said they should be first line for adolescents. That's big, because these are not progressive organizations, I can tell you that. So that's big time. 
Um, so after getting the full counseling, talking, answering all her questions, she decides that that IUD sounds great for her, right? Because she wants to focus right now on finishing school, figuring out what her life plan is, you know, developing all her hobbies. She doesn't want to have to think about, you know, her birth control and the risk of pregnancy all the time. So in addition, she decides that she wants the hormonal IUD because it has the benefit of making her periods lighter or could potentially make her periods go away altogether, which is, would fit in really well with her active lifestyle. So now we come down to logistics, right? So what I did not tell you about these LARC methods, these great long-term methods, is that they're crazy expensive. I'm talking five to $800 for the device itself and the insertion, and that's at a place like Planned Parenthood where we have discounted pricing. In the private world, it's over $1,000 at least. So thankfully, in Baltimore City, we have a grant from a local foundation so that women who are underinsured or uninsured can get these devices for free, which is amazing. I'm so grateful for it. Um, so that's not an issue for her. I can really, she can make the best decision based on her life and, her, and the side effects of the methods and not based on what she can afford. But that's not the case for many women in the world. So then we do the insertion. We talk about, you know, she might feel some cramping, but with supportive measures, some medication, Motrin, usually women tolerate very, very well. It's important to use condoms for sexually transmitted infection protection, protection in addition to getting the IUD. Um, but she gets her IUD, same day. She can be doubt-free with her IUD for the next five years and really focus on all the things that are important to her, finding her lifetime partner if that's important to her, finishing college, figuring out what she wants to do with her life, but she doesn't have to worry about getting pregnant, which is really, really cool. So this is something that people just really aren't aware of, and I think it would be a great thing um, to see in more of these entertainment modalities so that we can increase awareness, because we can do something about this unintended pregnancy rate. We've seen in these study settings that it works um, when more women have access to these LARC methods, and more importantly, we've seen that when women have access to these methods for free, they actually really, really want them. So I'd love to see if you guys have any questions about that, and I thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. Awesome. Um, I know there's a lot of misconceptions. We're actually doing a video where we're taking, I'm just a bill from um, Sesame Schoolhouse Street. Rock, and we're doing I'm just a pill so that people can like, because they don't know that they can access Plan B anywhere and that it's sort of dismissing the whole it's an abortion thing because turns out science says it isn't, funnily enough. It's not amazing. Science <laughs> is something we don't listen to often enough when we're talking about healthcare because that's fun. Um, finally, before we get to questions, Jean, you have been working in a medium daytime that is incredibly influential and yet dealing with these kind of issues, especially reproductive health issues, has been, when I read what I read, I got a little freaked out and then I got mad, and I, mean, I know that you feel the same way. So dealing with abortion and dealing with repro really like strong reproductive health care issues is, is almost impossible for you, for you to put in narratives. Can you talk about that? Well, I think that um, uh, I don't know where the problem really arises. I think in some ways uh, the soaps have been uh, stuck in, a, in time. You know, they don't seem to be progressing. Uh, as as much as as other forms of entertainment, and in terms of what the the sponsors, the owners of the show, whatever, are willing to uh, portray, which I think is a, a huge mistake for a lot of reasons, but mostly because, as we all know, it, soaps are in peril. They're only when I started writing for soaps twenty something years ago, there were twelve shows. Now there are four, and uh, it's still a lot of time, you know, the five, five hours a week. So there's a lot of coverage. There's a lot of sexing it up, too. Yeah, there's the a lot of sexing it up, but not as much as you might think. I mean, there's a, there's a weird double message that's always existed in the soaps, which is, yes, we're all about romance and sex, and we want hot guys, and we want, you know, hot, hot, hot. But be careful, because kids come home in the afternoon, so, you know, be sure that you, you know, get moralistic about this as much as possible. So you know, there's sort of two messages at the same at time. At 2.45, a lesson That's right. happens. Yes, right, exactly. Um, and you know, I, I, but I will say, um, you know, in terms of the issue of abortion, I, I, I don't think w we're alone, it's we being soap opera writers, in having difficulty portraying that issue. I think it's, uh, I think it's gotten better. 
uh, gotten easier to, to maybe raise some of those issues, but it is still pretty much, uh, in my experience anyway, I've never gotten away with telling a story of any character having an abortion, even a monstrous, you know, slutified character. Um, <laughs> And I, you know, when I started out, I, I had all kinds of ambitions because I, I was raised in a family that was very pro-choice. My mother actually was a, an abortion counselor at Reproductive Health Services in St. Louis before it became Farm Planned Parenthood. And that happened because, um, I'll just tell you this quick story. She, in the early 60s, my father was a doctor and a, the mother of a friend of my older sister's called my mother to say, uh, look, I know abortion's illegal, but my 15-year-old is pregnant, and your, your husband's a doctor. Does he know anyone who would do an abortion? I think she wanted my mother to say, oh, he'll do it, but he wouldn't. Um, but she said, I have no idea, but I'll see what I can find out. And my mother, bless her little heart, got on the phone and called, of all things, the AMA and said, do you know any doctors who will perform abortions? And they said, sure, here's a list, seriously. And um, I'm sure there's more to this story. My mother was a great storyteller, but she left out a lot of details that I, that I do want to research at some point. Anyway, long story short, my, that my mother went with the woman and the girl, the, the young woman, the 15-year-old, uh, to a, a, a part of St. Louis where they'd never been before, downtown. Um, at night, I think it was like 10 o'clock at night, to a gas station where a, a strange man drove up in a car and took the girl, it would not let her mother go with her. So my mother sat there in a car and watched with this woman as her young daughter was driven away with a total stranger to she knew not where. And that was what prompted my mother to want to be involved once Roe v. v. Wade happened. and. She just felt very strongly about the need for a safe and, and, and legal abortion if that's the choice that's made. So I was full of all sorts of ambitions about wanting to tell a story that was sort of a community story. And I think one of the great things about soaps is that because we have so much time to fill, we have five hours a week and you know no hiatus and it's three you know all year long, 52 weeks, um, you can really tell a story from multiple points of view in some detail and I think um, it's it's always fun to to do that um, and it's uh, an unusual way of doing you give much more time to characters who ordinarily might be kind of um, on the sidelines of a story you get to hear their points of view so I thought wouldn't it be great to do a story where like as happened to my mother you know a, a woman gets sort of pulled into something and I, in my scenario, you know, she becomes a volunteer and the, the clinic where she works is attacked. And then there are, you know, you also play at the same time the reasons for whoever's getting the abortion needs to have the abortion, but you also want to play the points of view of the parents and the whatever, and not leave out the other side of the argument, which is those who sincerely believe that it's, uh, it's wrong to give them a chance to, to speak. Um, and that was absolutely uh, re uh, rejected out of hand, could not do that story. And then I thought, okay, well, maybe there are too much politics in that story, maybe just play the human story. And so the little piece that you saw of um, As the World Turns was actually years after this uh, rejected story. Um, and it was, um, I would say, partially successful in accomplishing some of what I wanted to do. That's my reserved, um, uh, response to that in that as I said we had lots of points of view we had the, the, the difference what one of the things we wanted to make clear was the little the girl who was supposed to be 17 uh, did not uh, had thought it through very carefully knew that having a child would absolutely interfere with her life and that she could not possibly be a competent mother to this child, nor did she feel she could carry a child to term and give it up for adoption. Her mother was a devout Catholic. We played, we had played that before, and her mother, when she found out, wanted to, her to keep the child. And then there were a lot of other characters involved. There was the ex-husband of the woman and the kids, the boy's parents, and everybody had a point of view. And we had the, the other complication, which was that, um, which is sort of hinted at at this, but 
the show allegedly took place in Oakdale, Illinois, and in Illinois uh, there uh, is a law, uh, I think it's a 48-hour um, you probably know waiting period. I think they have twenty. Oh no, it's a, is it twenty? It's mm -hmm. it's but there's a parental if you're it, underage. It, it, yeah, there's a parental. Your per, your, you, your parents can't say you can't have the abortion, but they have to be notified. They have to be notified. Anyway, so that we we had to play that. These kids got around it by getting a, an influential character to bribe a judge and get. I don't know what we did. I can't remember. <laughs> no doubt, money changed hands. Um, and. Uh, unfortunately, and you're all going to moan and gag when I tell you this, we were not allowed. I, my main goal was to have this child, in my mind she was a child because my daughter was about the same age at the time, um, have a, a reasoned uh, point of view about why, why she needed to make this choice and that she listened to other points of view, but ultimately stuck to her guns and was going to do it. And um, well, I was able to pull that off up until the very last minute. The one thing I wanted to avoid uh, was the final decision, oh no, I think I'll have the baby after all. I didn't want sentimentality to get into it. But since we, we couldn't give her the abortion, she, of course, fell down and had a miscarriage. And, because mm. that seems to be the default thing. Women that, are you know, so clumsy. They're so clumsy, and Just their uteruses falling. are so delicate, you know, that, that yeah. thump on the it's ground crazy. Just did it. Um, so that was very disappointing to me. On the other hand, um, I look back at it, and I think, OK, we were able to, to play weeks of, of hours a day in which the discussion uh, happened. And it happened in a way that was responsible. And I think that's really, at this point, maybe it's a lot. I don't know. I will say that just to sort of sum up everything I'm hearing, um, that you know the, what everyone is saying in one way or another is we have to have the conversation. And I do feel, uh, even though you know, in, in the soap, we ended up in a kind of ridiculous, melodramatic situation, which so often is the case, uh, kind of dictated by both the, um, the tropes that we all recognize as soap opera, but also the nature of having five shows a week. You know, you've got to keep it going. So, you know, you have to be able to get to whatever the next story beat is going to be, and that has to take you somewhere new. Um, but the com we did have the conversation, and I think that um, we obviously we, we have to keep doing that, be that it that story or a story about sexual assault or a story about cancer, all of which have been covered on the soaps with varying degrees of success. But we have an enormous opportunity to communicate with all that time at our disposal. So if we can just keep the shows on the air a little bit longer, I think if we come at it the right way, we can have all these kinds of conversations that we're all talking about and recognizing the need for. Great. Um, we're going to go to questions. And I just want to wrap up uh, um, just buttoning it all up before we go to questions. One in three women in her lifetime will probably have an abortion. And one in three. And so I know I'm like the comedian with the facts over here. I'm like, Susie, fact. Uh, I know. Um, but it's, and I think it's, What's imperative to me in the work that I have been doing, going on the road, talking to young women, talking to um, all kinds of people, clinicians, everybody, is two things. And that is um, places like Planned Parenthood, uh, they are under assault and they're providing a service and they also have become the number one advocate for themselves, which I think is wrong. I think that when you're providing the health care, um, the people who abused Planned Parenthood, independent clinics, um, need to stay involved and understand that sometimes people, that is where they'll go, and that is where they'll go always. And we can't have the people providing the health care also being their own advocates and also telling their stories. It's not right. Um, and second of all, I just want to say that um, because of that one in three statistic, people have abortions for a myriad of reasons. And the reason that should be accepted is because she, she needed an abortion. That should be the reason. And when we start parsing words and doing storylines that are always, well, she was raped, so she can have that kind of abortion, because that's the good kind of abortion, 
It really makes women have self-doubt when the decisions that they made to terminate a pregnancy fall into the other camp, fall into the bad kind of abortion. So in when we get to a place where we can really talk about abortion in a way that's about having one that's a part of healthcare, um, I hope we can do it, you know, where it all of a sudden it feels really organic and natural. So I just want to say that. So um, thank you all for coming. And now let's open it up for questions with all these really smart people. I think we should try to get some questions in. Do, do people have questions for our panel? Yes. Yeah, uh, obviously, uh, based on the statistics, there's an epidemic of sexual assault on campuses. And yet, sort of ironically, two of the biggest media stories in the past 15 years have been the Duke rape case and University of Virginia, which were narratives that ended up being about um, false accusations and rushes to judgment. So I'm just kind of wondering how, we don't have anybody from the news media here, but how, it, how are those narratives counteracted? Because you don't really hear too much about um, legitimate so-called rape on campus in, in that sort of big sense. Well, I mean, I would say that in the case of the Rolling Stone article, we don't really know what happened to that woman. The reporting was horrible and flawed, and that reporter was awful, and the non-fact-checking and all of that was awful, but we never got to exactly what happened, and so I just wanted to put that out there about that. But I do think when you have sensationalized people looking for a story, it every person who was considering probably reporting their sexual assault took pause and said, I can't, I can't, I don't know, I'm freaked out. And so, I mean, that's my take on it. Well, the, here's what's so dangerous about those being more sensationalized than anything else is that the fact is there are no, no more percentage-wise cases of false sexual assault that's reports right. than any other crime. Right. So like, people are freaking out at universities like, oh, well, all these mostly male students who are the perpetrators, um, you know, what if they're falsely ac accused and it will ruin their re reputation? People aren't going around saying, what if people are falsely accused of burglary yes. or, or muggings or any other sort of crime? Um, the, you know, the, the, the percentage of uh, true crimes that are committed is in, in the probably around 95%, which is commensurate with most other crimes. Uh, but that's not a very sexy story, uh, because then the story becomes, well, why are our universities and schools among the most unsafe places in the world when they're supposed to be our pride and joy and the thing that all of these students are working so hard for 18 years to get to? Yeah. Breaking um, news, the media is shitty. <laughs> that is why there was a Daily Show. I mean, it's like that should be the story. How horrible the media is not anything about like in that what you said is one of the most big one of the biggest takeaways is that f false rape claims are just as this in the same realm as any other false claim about any crime, and yet somehow it's been that whole thing. So I'm sorry we can't answer more, but we don't have a like journalisty person on the panel. We were talking about cancer, and then we were talking a lot about birth control, and uh, I've been out of the loop, so I was surprised to hear there's so many forms of birth control. But I was also wondering, is there any tie-in between cancer and these new things? I didn't know you could go without a period. It seems like it would be very unhealthy, but maybe it doesn't make any difference. I don't, I'm not a doctor, so. It's a great question. I actually love getting this question for my young woman. So I want you to think back to like olden day societies, right? What women started having babies at what age? About 13, 14 years old. They had maybe on average nine to 10 children a year and they breastfed each child for two to three years. How many periods do you think those women had in their lifetime? A handful, right? Having a monthly period is a recent phenomenon and actually um, the yeah. <laughs> I know, right? In my opinion. Um, the active cell um, uh, activity actually puts women at risk for an increased risk of ovarian cancer. So um, women who have BRCA mutations, for example, are often recommended to start um, oral contraceptive pills or some form of hormonal contraception early to suppress that activity, stop those birth control pills early, have children early, and then do what you know some um, folks do if they make the decision to have those organs removed and perhaps even a um, mastectomy. So um, there isn't a strong link between birth control and um, cancer. In fact, there's some protective effects. However, if a woman does have um, estrogen 
um, receptor um, positive breast cancer, then that's a conversation she should really have with her provider to make sure that it's safe for her in those specific circumstances. Good question. <clears throat> One more question. I guess my main point is because I work in the film industry, um, one is like how do we get these stories out there because just even, you know, pitching something like this to cover these targets, it's a big feat to have to deal with in itself. And then also in terms of like representation of whatever, I think it's more about just having stories that really hit the human heart irregardless of what race, sex, or whatever that I'm kind of praying with because um, I had all the education when I had cancer. I had all the things I think. Um, but, you know, that didn't really, that was not my process. You know, maybe it's like part of our jobs as media is not just to depend on media, but to encourage in our media for people just to interact with other people and things like that instead. You know, medium is a Media is a medium for dialogue, but the actual dialogue is with actual people, you know. So, yeah, I have very mixed feelings about it in the sense that um, when I had cancer, I just actually kind of tuned out of media a little bit. And that's how I kind of, like you were saying, making the obstacle your opportunity or something like that, you know. And then, you know, in terms of like the birth controls and so forth like that, you know, part of my process was when I had the cancer, it was actually blissful, but then afterwards I was, you know, uh, what's it called, um, clinically depressed from all the hormone changes, so I was experiencing um, puberty and menopause every month, and that was pretty crazy, you know, <laughs> and then like you're fearful of your, your job and things like that, and then in terms of the assault, I just feel like it's even deeper because we're, let's talk about family sexual assault or something like that. It's really not about the sex, it's about the power and the violence of human beings. And so how can we convey <clears throat> overcoming violent, I mean, you know, the personal violence that you would inflict on another person, that's all. I don't know if that made any sense or any value or a question, but that's the question I ask is how, as us as media makers, make people do the dialogue with other people and not so much depend on the media. I guess for me, I just decided to start this crazy nonprofit because of the very reason that it's really hard to talk about some of these issues and do it through a humor lens. Um, I, I called in all my friends and I said, I know your sex life. <laughs> You're gonna work with me on this project. <laughs> and they were also big support, but you know, I just, I kind of was like, I can't, you try, and, and it's hard because you do that struggle also with, it, you, you work in commercial media, right? And so they get to say and they get to have their say in what they do. But also if you're a creative person and you're a writer and a, you no longer sort of have the pass of not knowing how to use Final Cut Pro a little bit and making graphics a little bit and being able to put some shit out there that can make some noise. Because I think the first thing we have to do is prove to people that the noise that we want to make is something that people want to hear. And so when they see a video that you make on a topic that you love gets a million hits, like I did this video with Sarah Silverman where Jesus comes to visit her and it's Jesus is the guy from NCIS and she's talking about birth control and he's, Jesus is like, no, life begins in 40. And it's really funny, but it really talks about all of the clinics shutting down in Texas. You know, that is something that people watch and they go, oh, you can actually use humor to talk about reproductive health and even abortion and all these bad actors are out there. And so I think as creatives, if we care, it's incumbent upon us to take some of those steps that are outside of what, so they always have to be shown that it works. They are not smart, we are smart. We're the ones that make things. The people that buy things are stupid. <laughs> For the most part, I think we can all agree on that. And so we have to continue to show them constantly that. So I think, I hate to say it's incumbent upon us, but it's incumbent upon us to like take some steps to do stuff and, and in a larger place it is. And I've been going at this for about a year and I think I might be actually taking this website that we did into a bigger realm because somebody saw the value in shitting on bad guys. Because that's what we're doing, we're shitting on bad guys and they deserve it. And sometimes people don't know they're bad guys, but sometimes you got to like put it out there. People who don't care about breast cancer, what women are going through, they're bad guys. Expose them as such. People who don't care about reproductive access, 
they're bad guys, expose them as such. People who want to claim that women fake rape, they're bad guys, expose them. So, you know, that's just, that's my opinion. Anybody else, guys? Talk it up. Amen. You're in? <laughs> yes. Amen. Amen? Amen. I thought you said I'm in. I'm in too, okay. I like that. That, <laughs> that works. Bo, but, what do you got? No, I've already done too much talking. No, you're very smart. <laughs> Um, all right, well, we have to wrap it up, but um, thank you all for coming, and thank you guys. You are all just tremendously smart and insightful, and thank you for the work you do. And thank you. Oh, I just blabbed on and on. Thank you, guys, and um, keep talking about this stuff, and thank you for all the good work you're doing. <laughs>